So lesson six today is going to be really short and quick for you guys. So lesson six, we're focusing on solving problems by finding equivalent ratios. So I think we've learned what equivalent ratios are enough that you guys are comfortable with them. So today we're going to use take diagrams to solve problems when a given ratio between two quantities and a change those two quantities that changes the ratio. So given a ratio means I'm going to be telling you a ratio. So for example, I will say the ratio is 3 to 2. And then it's saying there's going to be a change. So what that means is one of these will go up and the other one will go down. Something's going to happen to change our ratios. So this ratio might then become 4 to 1. So that's the change we're talking about. Our change is also going to make sure that whatever I do to one side of the ratio, I do to the other. So here you'll notice I increased it by 1. So what's going to happen is I need to decrease this side by 1. You'll notice that they both equal 5 when I add them together. Notice this one. In my change of ratio, if I had 6 to 10, and I'm going to change my ratio to, um, let's do 4 to 12, you'll notice when I add these two together, I get 16. And when I add these two together, I get 16. So if there's a change that's taking place, both ratios at the end of the chain should still equal that same number. In this case, they both equal 16. All right, let's watch this video, and then we'll get started. The video is about five minutes. Let's find two equivalent ratios to the one that's been given. Well, in order to find an equivalent ratio, we can do this a couple of different ways. We could use multiplication or division. So here, let's look at each of these ways. First, let's take a look at using multiplication to find an equivalent ratio. So we've been given the ratio 5 to 20. And we want to find an equivalent ratio first using multiplication. Well, remember, ratios can be written a few different ways. So here, let's start out by converting our ratio into a fraction. This will make it much easier to work with. So we have this ratio here. And in order to turn it into a fraction, we take the first number of 5 and write it in the numerator or the top of the fraction. And we take the second number, 20, and write it in the denominator or the bottom of the fraction. So this ratio, 5 to 20, is the same as the fraction 5 over 20. Now all we need to do is use multiplication to find an equivalent fraction. To do that, we want to take this fraction and multiply it by a fancy form of 1. Now here's where we can be creative. We can pick any fancy form of 1 that we want. So we can take 5 over 20 and multiply it by a fancy form of 1. We just need to pick a number and put it over itself. So let's pick 2. We take 2 and put it over itself. And look, 2 over 2 reduces to 1. So really, we're just taking our original fraction and multiplying it by a fancy form of 1. As long as you multiply by a fancy form of 1, that resulting fraction will be an equivalent fraction to our original one. So here in the numerator, we take 5 times 2. In the denominator, we take 20 times 2. 5 times 2 is 10, and 20 times 2 is 40. So we get 10 over 40. 10 over 40 is an equivalent fraction to 5 over 20. They have the same value. They just look a little different. But remember, our original ratio was given to us in this form, not as a fraction. So let's rewrite our fraction to look like the ratio that was originally given to us. So we have 10 over 40. And to rewrite this as a ratio that looks like this, we take the numerator of 10 and write it first, and take the denominator of 40 and write it second. And now, using multiplication, we have found an equivalent ratio to the original one that's been given. Now, in order to find our second equivalent ratio, let's instead use division. So here, we're going to divide in order to find another equivalent ratio. 
to do this, start out the same way we did before when we use multiplication. Convert our ratio into a fraction. So we end up getting the fraction 5 over 20. Now we need to take 5 over 20 and use division to find an equivalent fraction. To do this, we want to divide the numerator and denominator by the same number. That will create an equivalent fraction. And to pick that number, look at the numerator and denominator. Pick a common factor. That way, when you divide, you'll get an integer in both the numerator and denominator. Between 5 and 20, a common factor is 5. So, we take 5 over 20, then we divide the numerator and denominator by 5. And look, 5 over 5 reduces to 1. So here, we're taking our fraction and dividing it by a fancy form of 1. That means that the resulting fraction will be an equivalent fraction. That fraction and our original fraction will have the same value. They'll just look a little different. In the numerator, we take 5 divided by 5. And in the denominator, we take 20 divided by 5. 5 divided by 5 is 1, and 20 divided by 5 is 4. So 1 fourth is an equivalent fraction to 5 over 20. But remember, we need to put that fraction into the form we were originally given. So instead of 1 fourth, we can rewrite this as the ratio 1 to 4. So here, we use both multiplication and division to find two different equivalent ratios to the original one given. Here we found that the ratio 5 to 20 is equivalent to the ratio 10 to 40, which is also equivalent to the ratio 1 to 4. Alright, so let's work on this problem. This is the only problem you're going to be doing today. The other problem you're going to work on with the other people at the computer station. This is the only problem we'll be doing today on the computer. The Business Direct Hotel caters to people who travel for different types of businesses. On Saturday night, there is not a lot of business travel, so the ratio of the number of occupied rooms to the number of unoccupied rooms is twenty-five or 2 to 5. However, on Sunday night, the ratio of the number of occupied rooms to the number of unoccupied rooms is 6 to 1 due to the number of business people attending a large conference in the area. If the business district hotel has 432 occupied rooms on Sunday night, how many unoccupied rooms does it have on a Saturday night? So the first question down here is telling me I need to highlight the key information. So what do I think is key information? Well, I noticed that there's two different things going on here. We're talking about a Saturday night, and we're talking about a Sunday night. So I'm going to highlight those two things. I'm going to hide them, highlight them in different colors since it's actually talking about two different kinds of ratios. So here I have a Saturday night, and I see we're talking about the ratio of the number of occupied rooms to the number of unoccupied rooms. And that's a 2 to 5. So on a Saturday night, the ratio of occupied to unoccupied is 2 to 5. On a Sunday night, though, I see it's slightly different. On a Sunday night, the number of occupied rooms to the number of unoccupied rooms is 6 to 1. All this stuff, the reason why there's a number of business people attending a large conference, that's kind of extra information, so I don't actually need it to solve my problem. And then the last part that is important is it's talking about there's 432 occupied rooms on a Sunday night. So I highlight Sunday all in yellow so I can keep that information straight. And then my question, what is it asking me to find out? It's asking me to find the unoccupied rooms on a Saturday night. So that's a lot of information I'm going to have to start out with and I'm going to have to organize. So how should we start this problem? Well, my guess, looking at that I can statement we have, is I'm probably going to be using a Tate diagram. That Tate diagram is going to help me organize my information. So let's look here. Here's my Tate diagram. Saturday, O and U, that O stands for occupied, that U stands for unoccupied. This 2 to 5 I look comes from right here, and it's orange. So I know it's that Saturday night. 
So my ratio is two occupied rooms for every five unoccupied rooms. Sunday is going to be the same thing. On Sunday, it tells me that there's a six to one ratio. And since it's yellow, I know it's on a Sunday night. So here I have my six occupied rooms and my one unoccupied room. All right, so let's look at this question now. Did the number of rooms, so there's my typo, did the number of rooms the hotel has change between Saturday and Sunday? So another way to think of this is, did the hotel suddenly build rooms on Sunday? Or did they suddenly demolish or get rid of rooms on Sunday from Saturday? No, a hotel's a building, and it's always had the same number of rooms. It's just like your house. If you have a house, you don't suddenly build extra rooms when you have guests come and stay, and then get rid of those rooms when the guests come and stay, and when they leave. No, your house is just there and always has the same rooms. If your house has three rooms in the morning, it's probably going to have three rooms the next day. So my hotel actually has not changed any room numbers. It hasn't magically added or built rooms, and it hasn't demolished or taken away rooms. Notice how each of the tape diagrams adds up to seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this goes back to my very first um, slide. I've done a quantity change. Here, I increased it by four. The two went to six, and I decreased this by four. But they will both add up to seven. So now what do we do? Well. How many occupied rooms are there on Sunday? So I'm going to go back to my um, original question, and I'm figuring out how many rooms are there on Sunday. Well, if I look, I see Sundays in yellow. And look, here's a number that's telling me. It says on Sunday there's 432 occupied rooms. So let's go down here, and I see 432. I'm going to write that before I forget. And that's on Sunday for my occupied rooms. So look at this, 432. That is my occupied. So that's this part right here. This ratio, this 6, represents 432. That's my number of occupied rooms. So what do I need to do next? I need to figure out how much does each box represent? How much does this box represent? in this box. I know all the boxes together is 432. How much is each individual box? Well, what I need to do is I need to divide. I need to make equal groups. So I need to do 432 divided by my number of boxes. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So I'm going to divide it by 6. 42, 1, bring down that 2, and there I go. So each box is going to represent 72. So this box is 72, this box is 72, and so on. Now we have enough information to answer a question. If the business district hotel has 432 occupied rooms on Saturday night, how many unoccupied rooms does it have on Saturday? I think I misread that, so um, if I did, I apologize. So just to help us out, if you forgot, I just found a previous slide that each one of these boxes is 72. If I add up all of my occupied rooms, I would notice that it equals 432. Now what do you notice about this box and this box? Well, the purpose of tape diagrams is that we can compare equal size boxes. If something's equal, then that means it's the same. So these two boxes are the same size, that means they're equal. What do you notice about this box and this box? Well, it's also 72. This box is the same size, so it's 72. In fact, all these boxes are the same size, so they're all 72. 
starting to get it now? So let's look at what the question is asking us. How many unoccupied rooms does it have on a Saturday night? Well, here's my Saturday, and here's my unoccupied. So what I need to do is I need to do 72 times 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, since there's 5 boxes. I could also, if not good, multiply. I could do 72 plus 72 plus 72 plus 72 plus 72. But this way is going to be slightly faster. When I multiply 72 times 5, I'll get 360. So my answer for how many unoccupied rooms does it have on Saturday is 360. All right, so you guys are ready to now start this task. If you get confused, come back, watch the video, pull parts out to assist you. But you're going to be working now with the people at the computer group. Okay, this is your goal. You are now going to be working with your table groups, or in this case, with your computer or PC groups. You're going to have 25 minutes. You guys on the computer might have slightly more or less, depending on when you finish this video. You're going to complete a poster with your given problem. You are then going to present your poster to the class for a grade. So yes, even though you're on the computers today, you guys will be presenting as well with the rest of the class. Your poster must have a tape diagram showing equal parts. So here, if I look, is my tape diagram showing equal parts. I see each part is 72. The problem written out. So if this was the problem you were given, you would have to write, yes, that entire thing out on your poster so people can come up and look at it. So you'll have to write your entire problem out. And I'll give you your problem when you finish this video. You need to have an explanation explain how you arrived at the solution. So write out what you did, how you did it, why you did it. Everyone's name. This should be the easiest part. Whoever worked on the poster puts their name on the poster. And then, is it presentable? Does it look nice? Does it look orderly? Or does it look like you just put it in a second grade classroom and said, second graders, do your best? All right. Good luck. Your problem is on the trapezoidal table. You may begin as soon as you are ready. And when other people on the computer stations finish their poster, um, then they may come and assist you as well. If you guys finish the poster before we're ready to present to the class, you may go to AAA Math, you may go to Typing Games, or you may go to, what's our last one? Um, math Games. Any one of those are fine once your poster is all finished and you're ready to present. All right, good luck. Work on your poster. Be ready to present when I say the rest of the class is presenting as well.